Okay. All right. So I was going to say that this webinar is being recorded, but uh, the recording beat me to it. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our monthly national TA webinar. And uh, just before, um, I, by the way, my name is Dennis Pearson, and I am a program manager here at the Center for Quality Improvement. And I also have my colleague, um, Shay Gonzalez, who's assistant. And um, I'll introduce our presenter in a moment. But just a couple of housekeeping or reminders. As I said, the webinar is being recorded. And, um, you know, during the presentation, please feel free to enter any questions um, that you may have in the chat. Both Shay and myself will be, you know, will be monitoring the chat. And lastly, um, please stick around just for a few minutes, um, you know, just to complete an evaluation poll that we normally uh, present at the end. So once the presentation is over, don't run away, um, you know, please complete the poll. This gives us an opportunity to learn, you know, what we can do better, you know, and how we can better meet your future needs. So it's important that you um, stick around for the poll. Okay, so let's move right into it. So. Um, this afternoon's presentation is, as you can see on the screen, the psychology of change, understanding the human side of change to advance and sustain improvement. And our presenter for this afternoon is uh, Nova West. Nova West is actually one of our colleagues here in the New York uh, City office. And, um, you know, she has over 20 years experience working in HIV AIDS and hepatitis C. And since around 2011, she has served as a program manager at the New York State Department of Health AIDS Institute within the quality of care and Ryan White HIV AIDS Part A program. So with that, Nova, I turn it over to you, my friend. Thank you, friend. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. Nice to meet everybody. Um, so yes, so today, as Dennis mentioned, I'll be talking about the psychology of change, otherwise known as the human side of change. So we know there's been countless evidence-based improvements and innovations, and they take years to be adopted and, and don't become a common practice. And this is due to issues relating to um, adoption and sustainability. So our goal is to share how understanding the human side of change will help bridge these gaps. So I want this to be an engaging, dynamic session. So feel free to unmute and speak. And I, I like voices. Um, I also like reading the chats too. Um, so um, I wanted to ask, um, and remember to unmute when you're, when you're uh, speaking, what are some reasons change is resistant, resisted? What are some reasons there's resistance to change? Being comfortable. Being comfortable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown. Lisa, feel free to unmute yourself. I think some people feel threatened when you suggest a change because that implies to them that they were doing it wrong um, or that they were doing it badly and that asking them to do it in a different way is a threat to their self-esteem. Okay. So true. I see some in the... Oh, I see uh, the chat fear of the unknown, fear again. Oh, fear is popular. Uh, if you did a word cloud, we'd see fear right up there. Um, not understanding why, mm -hmm. it's very important. Changes happen really often. So maybe too much change, <laughs> right? Comfort with the status quo. Yes, we've heard that. Comfortable not being uncomfortable. So there's a lot of comfort related. I, I like this. We should make this in a word cloud at some point. So. Uh, more work. Yes, Jeffrey, that's true. Oh, there's more coming in. I love it. Like a cascade of issues. <laughs> um, not knowing if change is the right thing, unsure of the outcome, uh, unsure of the outcome of change, 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 just change. <laughs> People resist change just because it's change, right? Um, <laughs> unclear expectations. It can be exhausting. So much change lately, I get that lack of trust and really, yes, unclear expectations. That's yeah. a big one. Good, good one. Um, believe that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. All right, Simon. I read that with how I think you'd say it. <laughs> so, you know what? I want to say there are good reasons to resist change. 
And I want to open the, open it up by saying there is there are good reasons to, to resist change. And we can be too quick to move to achieve compliance and miss opportunity to learn about the reasonable concerns people have. Isn't it easy just to label, oh, they're resistant. They just don't get it. They're not where at my level, right? And we can get that attitude really easy. When if you think about it day to day, when there is change, you're everyone is thinking, well, why are we doing this? There are important things that we need to address. And even, you know, look framing it that way. And I really wanted to start out with this question so that we can embrace the reality that resistance is a part of change. Resistance isn't something that we are shunning, but rather we're embracing. We're inquiring into resistance. When you inquire into resistance, it can reveal opportunities to get true buy-in and get to a shared purpose and goals. So it's very easy to take like this soapbox and say, oh, we all need to stop resisting. But everyone has mentioned some reasonable um, reactions uh, to to change and there's also really good ex reasons why change should happen so um but it's important to get it yeah. to understand all these different reasons the positives the reasonable ones and the ones that are unreasonable so that we can get true buy-in so okay so our learning objectives why is my screen not changing okay great so some of our learning objectives is to describe the important side of change within W.E. Deming's system of profound knowledge. I gave a presentation on that um, a few months ago and also discuss the psychological and behavioral responses to change. And just to look at it, that some of it is predictable. Understand that resistance is a part of change. Learn how to leverage concepts of human behavior to positively impact QI efforts and apply technique from Einstein's framework for the psychology of change. So Deming's lens of profound knowledge. Uh, so there are four uh, lens. So you have appreciation of, syst of the system, um, understanding variation, fear of knowledge, and the, the, the one that we're discussing today, psychology, the theory of human behavior. If you think about a simple um, public health issue as hand washing, for the system portion, you wanna look at, well, who's involved and who's involved, it's going to impact the compliance based on who's involved. If it's surgery and ER docs, they have more of a need to, to be compliant than someone in physical therapy or in administration. Administrators, however, they are, their role could be ensuring the policy and the resources support the compliance. Um, understanding variation, you're going to want to look at the measures and data shows variation. It could tell you the variation by department and can reveal different processes and practices. And when you think about knowledge, um, knowledge drives your behavior. So it'd be, you, you know, back in the days, there, there wasn't a concept of germs. So hand washing wasn't as, um, uh, it was a, a knowledge that needed to, um, you needed to inform people about the importance of the, the, the presence of germs and the importance of hand washing. And psychology, human behaviors, that's the human side of change. And you have to understand what motivates behavior. So what is the psychology of change? Um, psychology is defined as a science of the mind and human behavior, especially as a function of awareness, feeling, or motivation. And change is to cause to be different or to transform. So when you put those together, the psychology of change, the science and the art of human behavior as it relates to transformation. Um, w. Deming stressed the importance of psychology, the adaptive human side of change. People have an innate desire to create value and we must move from the system driven by fear and, and extrinsic motivation to those driven by people's intrinsic motivation. So it's about seeing people as a fundamental source of value. If you think about trying to buy something and you come across a salesman or that stereotypical youth salesman and they're pushy and they're using their psychology to, 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 to get you to sell you something, this is not what we're talking about. That's, that's manipulation. Um, this is a more of a noble work where we are seeing people as a fundamental source of value. And, and it's gonna take some work and expertise to create a culture that respects and motivates them. So that's 
the attitude what we're, when we talk about um, psychology of change, not to psych or to sell something to them. It's more of this much harder work of engaging people. So there are two types of, uh, uh, two sides of the coin when you think about um, change. So you have technical challenges and you have adaptive challenges. So when you have technical challenges, those are clearly defined and these can be solved by experts. Um, it can be achieved in a, in a short time frame. You create a policy, a training document, um, you stock the head. So those are the technical challenges, very easy to be solved. You don't really have to negotiate to get it done. You just, you know, you just check the boxes. The adaptive challenges that's harder to identify and must be solved by the people affected by the problem. And it requires more time to achieve those outcomes. It, the adaptive approach is um, relies on people's commitment to adopt new values, competencies, beliefs, and behavior. Okay, so um, Everett Rogers um, is responsible for this, the whole theory of diffusion of innovations. So in his book, um, Diffusion of Innovations, um, he talks about uh, how change is um, spread. And one of the things he said is um, innovation must be widely adopted in order to become self-sustaining. Each adopter's willingness and ability to adopt an innovation would depend on their awareness and their interest. And diffusion manifests itself in different ways and is highly subject to the type of adopters and the process for engaging others to adopt the innovation. So this is a, a model that he has. Um, it's a little modified because we inserted a little chasm um, here. So first you have, um, he described, defines five categories of adopters. So you have the innovators, the early adopters, the early majority, the late majority, and the laggards. So if you think of anything that has been introduced and new technology, are you the first one to get it? Or you might know someone who's the first one to stand in line <laughs> to get the new tech, the new version, and they they are the, the um, well, actually, the innovators come a little early because they they're they're what they're creating the new thing and they're ready to try something different. Then you have the early adopters; um, those are the ones that are you know really eager to try something new. And the early adopters they're very important because they're dependent. Um, without them, the early majority, early majority, they're watching the early adopters to see how things pan out for them before they jump on that train. So very important group here. So thank you all the early adopters here, you are very important for spreading change. Um, and you might know when you're doing your quality improvement project, you have that champion, that person who really buys into it and their enthusiasm is infectious. So important to treasure your early adopters because you need them in order to reach, reach critical mass. So once you bridge that, once you, so I, I would say, don't worry about the laggards and those who are waiting. I know laggards sounds like a really harsh term. Another term for them is traditionalists, which is a little bit more noble. I like that. So, <laughs> and you know, nothing wrong with being a traditionalist. In some ways, in some areas of my life, I'm a traditionalist. In some areas, I'm an innovator. So depending on what it is, you find yourself on the spectrum. So not dissing any <laughs> one wherever you find yourself, but the, we all play an important part, but I want to say that as an innovator, as an improvement coach, value your early adopters. Don't worry about the, the person who are going to be bought in later. Focus on those who are invested a little bit, uh, you know, invested at first and have them run with them. So, Okay. Okay, so again, again, as we've been talking about resistance, resistance, resistance is an inherent characteristic of change. If you encounter resistance, you are doing something right. So despite its commonality, resistance continues to surprise, frustrate, and confound many of our best efforts to change. So, but um, just really understanding, embracing that it's a part of it, and and I know even though you know this, it's still going to surprise you. You're still going to be shocked. Oh my God, not everyone bought into my improvement idea. <laughs> they, they're not as excited as I am. It's always a little, you know, 
you know, kills your ego a little bit, but I think being really, really prepared and knowledgeable that this is a part of it is going to help us dance with it a little bit better, embrace it, and not be discouraged. Yeah, as so many times you start something and there's a lack of enthusiasm, so you end up shelving it for a little bit. Um, so just but just knowing that change is hard and it's difficult and that we all have this curiosity and this need to be engaged and need to see how things work out first before you kind of jump on board is, is really important to help move things forward and help you become less discouraged and a little bit more empathetic for those who aren't as excited as you are. So some 10 reasons people resist change. Um, this is by Rosabeth uh, Cantor. So you, some of these are mentioned early before us so that might sound familiar. So you have the loss of control, right? How many, how many of us like the loss of control, not being in control, <laughs> right? Okay. Excess uncertainty. So we heard a lot of that. Fear of the unknown. Unease with surprise. How many of us know the person that you should not give a surprise birthday party to? <laughs> Anybody like that? I'm curious. Anybody like that here? Do not I, surprise them with a party? My son. <laughs> my son does not like surprise birthday parties at all. And he's nine. So I don't know if he's going to break that habit. <laughs> Oh, uh, we surprise my dad a lot, but he doesn't believe people should be surprised, but he's okay with it. So, okay, another reason back to our, our Letterman countdown. <laughs> um, everything seems different. The loss of faith. Uh, so change is a departure from the past. So sometimes, you know, that's a little comfortable. You know, things remain in the same. There's a comfort, you know, like you go into your grandparents' house. It's the same that sometimes you do some kind of like, oh, things are still the same. So some people are really, you know, it's really uh, disheartening when things shift around. Um, concerns about competence, right? So if you have something new, you have new, new things to learn. Uh, there's more work. That's a reality. There's ripple effects. You change one thing, it continues to, to affect um, other things. Oh, oops. Past resentments. That's true. You've been burnt once. Um, and sometimes a threat is just real. It's real. <laughs> like the change does come with change. Well, change comes with change. Yeah. Change comes with this reality that, that, that yes, some of these things are, are going to happen. And, um, but it's important to understand this. And it, but thankfully with um, improvement work, there's benefits. Like not, nothing that we're doing <laughs> is to, is, is all for the greater good, right? So um, that, that helps us. So it's, um, some of these hopefully aren't or, or, all a reality. So um, resistance comes in many forms. Um, so resistance comes in the form of emotions or behaviors meant to impede being changed. People demonstrate it as apathy, hopelessness, compla complacency, self-doubt, outright rejection, and most of all, fear. There's subtle forms, right, of resistance. That's the one we need to be um, very mindful of. So at, in public, they're acting in accordance. Oh, yeah, this is great. They smile. Yes, privately disagreeing. <laughs> That's the scary one, right? So especially in compliance-based settings, that attitude is more, um, it's more prevalent. And it comes from many sources, senior leaders who resist the provision of resources for improvement to occur, to frontline staff and patients who resist improvements that require changes in behavior. I think the subtle forms of resistance, that was surprising when I was re you know, researching this topic, I thought that rang true to me because it's easier to it's easier to engage someone who's outright defiant. You know where they stand, but someone's saying, "Yeah, this is great," and nothing moves. <laughs> and you want to watch that happen? They say they want to do it, or they say they're on board, and it's not moving forward. And that's harder because you have to, you know, getting people more transparent and having that um, safety to be able to say, "I agree," or "I don't agree," or "I'm not comfortable," or this thing terrifies me helps so I do think when you have open discussions um, appreciative inquiry 
have a safe space to talk about how you really feel or what's really going on is important. And that, that takes work. So, okay, here's the bell curve again. So, um, so let's um, move on and talk about how to overcome resistance. When you look at how change spreads on this bell curve, um, as we mentioned, um, the adopters will be your, your first, um, will be important champions and allies. They'll be the ones who get the early majority to jump on board and cause your adoption to reach that tipping point. Which, is, which was noted on the side. Uh, as the majority is able to observe and the, tr the trials, they will see relative advantage and, co and compatibility and simplicity of your change that you've ensured will be the case through your early PDSA. So, you know, you know, when you talk about starting small, I know it's easy to jump the gun and just wanna implement on a large scale and do a whole lot of things all at once because now you're motivated. But for the sake of adoption, it's easy to start small because you'll be able to gain momentum. So it's worth it to walk, to go a little slower up the bell curve so that you can, you know, you, you get a lot of momentum faster. So there's this book that I really love. It's called Switch and it's by the Heath brothers, Chip and Dan Heath. It's an incredible book on change. It's called um, Switch, How to change things when change is hard, uh, important topic. Um, so I know a lot of times we talk, when we talk about quality improvement, we talk about systems, logics, data, the things that we need to talk about. We also talk about motivation. The, you know, the human side of change is not new. I know this is not the first time you're hearing this. Um, the first quality 101, I know this was shared, but how much do we, in we, how much, energy and attention do we talk about the this side of change the human side of change i don't think enough it, i don't think a, a proportionate amount of attention is given to how much this really affects everything because you could have your trusty checklist yes i developed it i spent all this time i'm going to start a pdsa and the, the the harder part of it is the <laughs> engagement of people getting people to buy in and getting them on the same page and having the leadership support and the resources. So, so it's more wanting to shift, I hope this discussion, give more attention to this aspect. Um, yes, so um, people are, so leveraging change, people are typically motivated by in, in emotion and not information. I know we don't like to admit it, but this is the truth. <laughs> we're far more illogical than we want to admit and um so so in in this in this book uh dan and chip they have the analogy of the rider and elephant the rider represents the rational side and has some small degree of control the elephant represents the emotional side instinctive looking for a quick payoff rather than long-term benefits the elephant carries a lot of weight and is powerful. And the path represents a situation in which the change is to take place. So, um, so where the writer loves facts and figures, options, analysis, paralysis, the elephant is more responsible, responsive to whatever make it, makes it feel good. We may believe that the writer is always in control and leading the elephant along the path. But if a six ton elephant decides to change direction, perhaps because it saw a juicy tree just off the path, guess who's going to win? The elephant is powerful. Your emotions are powerful. When you wanna change behavior in a certain direction, we wanna address both sides of the brain, both the rider and the elephant. Um, by directing the rider, you need the rider needs clear direction. That's gonna reduce mental paralysis. You want to motivate the elephant, find the emotional connection. It's there if you invest, right? And you also want to shape the path, which is reduce the obstacles, tweak the environment, and that will help the journey to go, more, you know, downhill. Like you're not swimming upstream anymore. So um, I really do, I, I really like this um, analogy. You really could apply it to a lot of things. What does clear direction means for you? Um, I know I've been talking a lot, so maybe I'll kind of, I'll open it up. <laughs>
what 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 does clear direction would mean in the case of uh, introducing a new workflow? What would what would uh, the appealing to the writer? Oh, I've seen. Well, I see um, some uh, comments in here. <laughs> yeah, so what are what are some things that help your pro um, when you want to give fair direction for a change? What tools have you used? So I'll jump in. Oh, there you go. Yamil put in data. Thank you, Yamil. Mm hmm. It's great. Yeah. Written instructions. Written instruction. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Illustrated instructions. Great. Toolboxes, timeline, share the stats as well as the reason why the change is being made. That's important. So that's both the ration, that's both the right and elephant, right? Um, checklist. What are some ways you um purpose? I like purpose. I think you're answering my second question. <laughs> How do you motivate the elephant? And Jamil says purpose. Read my mind. <laughs> Anyone else? I love that. If you want to elaborate on purpose, feel free. Have you been able to inspire um purpose or uh provide technical assistance important and relate how it benefits something that a community has identified as a need change a chain choose a change that re resolves a complaint I like that yeah it's nothing like you 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 you're introducing new change but they've never responded to something simpler <laughs> it's it, you know it just brought back brought back, brought back uh, a memory so um Choose a chain that resolves a complaint. Tie back to a bigger picture. I love that. I love that. If you want to ex expand on that, Gita, hope I'm pronouncing your name right, please do. Training to help educate and provide knowledge for the change. Love that. I love it. It's not, it's more than, a, you know, just, just do it. Nike, just do it. Um, sometimes that's motivational, <laughs> but a lot of times we want to know what's behind the change and to share the knowledge. Improving outcomes, I like that. Create a change team to ensure the motivation is from more than one person. Wow, Alfred, do you want to share on that? Well, sometimes we have people who are really excited about change and they are those early adopters or the inventors, but others are not as excited. And having just that one voice that's always talking about change can be monotonous, and can become monotonous. So you need to have other change agents who can get into those groups and and help to to motivate incentivize the change i love that or multiple for, voices yeah. I, you know i might i you know there's some people that be able to speak to me some voices that are resound with me and sometimes another voice and that this is just so it also reminds me about why we engage consumers uh in care sometimes our voice is not what they need right? Sometimes they need their family voice, just another voice. So, um, so yes, for coming from, from different perspectives, people who were in their shoe have the same similar concerns. Um, it's important. Uh, thank you so much. And if anybody else want to expound, please feel free to um, um, share more. Um, so I see framing it in a way to support uh, what is important to the person, change that will benefit them, Involve stakeholders before making changes. Very important. Involving them, it, you, it's there's nothing like coming up with a thing on your own and then trying to implement it. Involving them in the change from the get go. Once you're develop, you're co-designing. And we're going to talk about that a little later. Co-designing uh, the change with others definitely helps. Um, bring it back to why your employees took the job in the first place. I love that. It's so easy to forget and to get to lose that. So um, it's good to remind each other, you know, every now and then have that sesh that brings up those old, those, 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 when you're fresh traced and hopeful <laughs> and not discouraged. Um, 
Oh, yes, yes, Rich, the importance of consumer involvement. Yes, and if you want to explore, expand more about that, please. Making communication style suited to the receivers. Oh, that is major. I love it and very unique. If you have an example of that, Yemel, um, feel free to, to expound, but I, I do enjoy that. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes um, you have... Um you know, different types of employees uh, with different education, di different backgrounds, mm -hmm. different socioeconomic, different uh, points of view. Maybe they have been through trauma. Um, all those things can change your, the way you communicate to them and the style and, and the words you choose. Thank you. Very important. I love it. We can't underestimate these. It's not just a bullet point <laughs> or a comment. This is really things that, um, that we, I hope we um, keep in mind. Um, so iChai has a, a psychology of change framework and a lot of it's centered around activating people's agency. And these are some of the tools that they've shared. Um, and we've mentioned this a couple of times, people are a fundamental source of value should be treated as partners, activate people's agency to act with purpose, offer tools to be effective, and provide a learning system for continual improvement. And if you think about it, this, a lot of this relates to Heath, the, the, um, the book Switch by the Heath brothers. Their imagery about the, um, the rider and the elephant in the past, uh, you know, people are some, fundamental source of change that, that appeals to, to the, both the writer and the, uh, the elephant, right? And offering tools to be effective, that's a little bit directing the writer and, um, and even the path. Providing a learning system for continual improvement, I think that is also helping the, the path. So I, I really like to think about the, the writer, the elephant in the path. So simple and yet powerful. I see Alfred wrote, uh, create teach back opportunities to ensure people really understand the proposed change. But there is a, yes, you know, teach back. I really like that. I think that ties into having a learning system for continual improvement. Um, I think always increasing in knowledge really creates this atmosphere that we're always learning, that you're not in a static place. And that helps change eventually. That helps change all your change. If if you create an environment where you know you're always learning and evolving, then change is easier to happen and more often. But if it's like static and then everything, you you believe everything you know is going to be the same all the time, then you you're not really in a learning environment. Um, but you need it this continual learning. So I think engaging and when you're on board and when you have your staff, just kind of create this idea that we're always evolving, we're always learning, we're always building is, is, is important and um, it helps to spread change. So, okay. So here is the psychology of framework in totality, but we'll be going through each one. Um, okay. so. Talked about people being instrumental for change. So agency is the ability of an individual to choose to act with purpose. They have power, power or the ability to act with purpose, courage or the emotional resources to choose to act in the face of difficulty or uncertainty. So I, this is a shift is to really um, giving people agency. So. When you are in a compliance mindset, you, you kind of jump over this whole idea that people have agency and they can choose. And yes, you have your supervisor and yes, you should do what your supervisor say, but you don't want to have that subtle resistance or this, uh, I'm just doing it because I'm told. You really want to engage a person's full self and by engaging them and just kind of respecting this idea that, if I equip them, if I sell, if I share the vision and the purpose, and I really believe that they also that that, that this change is important, and to focus on getting their full understanding of it, I think you'll you're gonna get a better uh, power behind the change that you have because you'll have somebody you know 
um, giving their full self to it rather than just um, doing what is asked. So um, what we wanna think about when we're doing change, when we're implementing a change is to think about a question that we're asking. So a question such as, how can I get all these people to do what I want to do? You change it to how can I get all these people to do what they want to do? I know that sounds crazy because like, oh, they just, they want to go home early. <laughs> they want to go on vacation. But, um, <laughs> but I think it is radical to ask it like that. But if you are very committed to, in, if you really believe in a change that you have and you frame it to that, this is something you believe once they understand and you're able to build, put a full picture to the change, they, they will be bought in. So, um, you know, for instance, I was in a, uh, I attended a, 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 a webinar and you talk about digital health and the, a lot of the conversations were saying, oh, people are resistant to technology. You know, they, they're resistant. They don't want to do it. They don't want to do anything new. And and then we started to have other discussions about the, the, the barriers. Oh, people are uncomfortable. They lack pri privacy and real legitimate things and I noticed that we fragmented those conversations and that really it wasn't that people were resistant is that we needed to address some of the the reasons that they're uncomfortable the reasons why um if there's a privacy issue um how to get them uh more open to the um the benefits of the different technology, and then the resistance will kind of go away. But if we focus and we just frame it as, oh, they're just resistant, we just got to make them do it, you'll never address the the uncomfortable portions or the you know the, you know these different issues that will help them to be um, adopters. So okay, all right, going on to Ichai's, uh framework. So the first one is to unleash intrinsic mo motivation. So um, so you want to tap into the source of intrinsic motivation and galvanize people's individual and collective commitment to act. And one of the ways to do that is telling a story. So they break it down as a story of self, personal stories that can access emotional resources embedded in our values can enable mindful action. The story of us Collective stories that can access the emotional resources embedded in the values shared by the group, of, um, the group of people engaged in the action, and the story of now. Stories that can transform the present moment into a narrative moment in which we are confronted by an urgent challenge. Access sources of hope and respond mindfully. So these three aspects and um, of the story is it's really important. And as was mentioned earlier about hearing different voices. I think this fits nicely with that. So the story of yourself, that's a personal connection to why you're doing it. The story of us, why all of us need to be, could, you know, could benefit from engaging in this and, and the story of now, what is urgent, what is necessary, what's a call to action. People respond to things that are, when you state the urgency. Um, so intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. So what which one is better at individual getting individuals to adopt a change? So um, and I'll I'll answer myself. <laughs> intrinsic motivation is sa satisfaction comes from from the activity itself. So that's the emotional reward of helping others, enjoyment and social interaction, improved efficiency. So yeah, it's really the thing that's just innate in us that we want to, um, it that motivates us. Extrinsic motivation, um, salaries, benefits, regulatory violations. These are important, <laughs> but um, they're not, it's research has shown that the most, um, the biggest pull comes from intrinsic. So just important to note, don't um, negate the salary, but, <laughs> but just understand that the intrinsic, if you can win their hearts, it, that's so much um, better. Um, Co-designing, so I mentioned this earlier. So the mo those most affected by change have the greatest interest in designing it in ways that are meaningful and workable to them. So you wanna really um, engage when you're doing a change, so co-design it with the people who are 
um, are most impacted. And something you want to do, you want to be become aware of bias, right? We have biases. You want to map actors. I don't know if you've ever had any activities where you map the actors. Who are the players? You have the stakeholders, you have the consumers, you have the people who need to implement the change, different actors, and just mapping them. And their quality improvement ex exercises, I don't see them a lot, but they do exist if you search them, um, about how to map the actors. Oh, oops, oops, I went too fast. Um, one is I force field analysis, system of profound knowledge. There's a lot of things that you could combine to, to get this idea. Um, you have another one where um, radiating circles of the different actors. Uh, so very important. Um, or, and I'll note the third one is craft people driven aid statements. So the who, with whom, what, how much, when, how, and how you know and 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 you centered around each person um co-produce in authentic co-produce in authentic relationships so changes co-produce when people inquire listen see and commit to one another so some recommended practices you want to uh, one on one meetings having open and honest uh questions practice appreciative inquiry and listen deeply. So we talked a little bit about that, how important it is to create that safe space so that you don't just have that, oh yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> when behind that smile is like, no, I won't. So <laughs> important to cope, you know, work on having, yes, we are, we are in a work environment. We know we're not, a, you know, um, we don't want to overly put this false sense of where a family kind of narrative that's manipulative, but 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 really uh, do practice um, appreciative inquiry and have that respect to that you hear, you want to hear what others are saying and you are listening to them. You might not be able to solve it, but I to be honest, I think listening, actually I'm gonna spend a little time on this. I, you know, there's this program, I would call them and, you know, I need them to submit, <laughs> you know, their data and I call and it's 20 minutes <laughs> on the call of ranting of everything that's going wrong, all the pressures that they're under. And you know what I say after that? Give me your data. No, I don't say that. I say, I dig in a little bit more. Tell me more. And I listen. <laughs> and that developed a lot of trust. And it's, it makes it easier for me to even get the data later because I'm listening, I'm hearing, and I'm not trying to rush with my ask. You know, um, I think I think listening, a lot of listening and more listening is really helpful and you'll get your ask later and faster the next time. But it takes time to build that relationship. Uh, Distribute power. So people can contribute their unique assets to bring about change when power is shared. So as much as this is possible, I don't know what level everyone is here. I know we, I'm sure we are at different, um, we have, uh, 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 at different places, roles within our agency. So as much as you can, right? Um, distribute um, power or share that with your um, super supervisors. Um, create a shared sense, shared sense of purpose, um, establish working agreements and seed power. Adapt in action. Acting can be moti a motivational experience for people to learn and iterate to be uh, effective. So, um, so recommended practices, um, coach and be coached. Adopt a growth mindset. That's a big one. Fail forward and embrace emergence. And again, um, this, um, this framework is really a people-powered approach. Um, it collectively, you know, moving people together. It brings people together on the basis of shared values, offers people agency to contribute. Their their assets unleashes people as partners in co-production of change. Uh, some 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 change methods um, ac uh, accelerate the adoption of QI. They are commitment driven, not compliance based. They cultivate people's agency to act increases joy, job satisfaction, and improved health. It builds capacity that serves as an ongoing resource for addressing other problems. 
So some QI tools, uh, you'll have access to this so you could look it up. And you could also go on IHTI's website. A lot of this information is from their website. And so you can look what tools relate to um, this. So let me take, um, <laughs> I see some things in the chat. Yes. A little, oh, I saw you were answering my questions in the chat. I'm sorry, I, I, I forget that I, I've asked you to put in the chat. Okay. Um, yes. So um, Lisa says also teach forward opportunities so that Earl, early adopters can encourage those who are less enthusiastic. Very important. Yes. Uh, Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I love that book. Seek First seek to understand and then to be understood. Love it. That is so important. Um, ask the five whys. Very important, Regina. Great input. The five whys is an excellent tool to be combined um, or with, with any issue. Uh, some people combine it with the uh, fishbone diagram, but the whys, you keep asking why, why, why until, and that really does connect people to the issue. And Christy wrote, sometimes it depends on the person, Regina, a little of both. Oh, intrinsic, and I was wondering, what is this in response to? Okay, to intrinsic and extrinsic, they, they both, yes, they do, um, you do need both. You do need both. Um, intrinsic is a long lasting feeling, and then intrinsic can, extrinsic can be short term feeling. I agree. Deep to mention principles of motivational interviewing. Yes. And I encourage to get back to the motivational in interviewing. It's interesting. I feel Sometimes the, the the meaning of it gets diluted over time. I've seen that become it becomes kind of too simplified. Oh, we're meeting them where they are, and has and it's more than that. It's more than that, and I encourage just a personal feeling of mine when I hear of it. A lot of time, I feel I feel it's been misapplied a lot in a lot of areas. But the motivation interview is a very powerful tool. And if you can get back to the core of what it meant to be, I think it can be continue to be a powerful tool for many of us. Passive agreement to things we do not agree with in order to avoid conflict. So common. We all learn how to this is how we learn to survive <laughs> in life. We just passively agree just, just to make it through. I get it. What we're talking about today is hard work. It's hard work and um, it's not easy and it takes a long time to build these relationships to, to get to the human side of change. It's, it's, it's not for the, the faint. It's a very, um, very hard work to do. Fail forward, yes. I, I, you have heard of failing forward. I think PDSA is a, is a little bit of failing forward. Uh, um, I know we're trying to improve forward, but you know, the lessons that we learn, we look, we, that's how we use lessons learned a lot, you know, um, cause we're, we're trying to learn quickly and that's why we do things on a small basis. So, but it, the framing of it fail forward is a very much more powerful, um, it's scary cause no one wants to talk about failure, right. As a step forward, but, um, but yes, um, I, I, I use, I'm not used to that term either at all, but when I think about PDSA, it, it does overlap a little bit. And Lisa says, every situation that feels like a failure cont contains experience and lessons that enable us, enable doing better next time. <laughs> yes. Yes, very, very, thank you. Thank you for Lisa, Lisa for explaining that, bro. Julie's thing. Okay. Um, let's move forward. So another tool is finding um, bright spots. Um, so I, I, I like, um, so bright spots are positive deviance. It's based on the observation that in every community, there are certain individuals or groups whose uncommon behaviors and strategies enable them to find better solutions to problems than their peers while having access to the same resources and facing similar or worse challenges. So, um, I do like this, um, example. It's a, it's a relational thing, um, and I, and, I, and I think it's a great tool for um, co-designing because you're co-designing with the people who are affected and, and yet thriving. So you wanna co-design with people who are, have these successes despite having the same challenges around. Okay, um, so another tool is forceful analysis. And on the last um, presentation, we a lot of, there was interest about 
having um, seeing this tool. So this is courtesy of uh, Jeff Birnbaum from um, SUNY Downstate. Uh, so I remember, you know, talking to one of my collaborators about test uh, three by testing, and they said, "Oh, it's it's easy. It's you just have to um, implement, you know, these changes and and just make it seamless, right?" Uh, I'm sorry, how to, instead of opt, one of the changes that we're discussing was instead of a uh, opt in, we have an opt out and just kind of set up your workflows to be that. And it was, and, I, and I said, well, it sounds easy, but how about you create a force field analysis that looks at really what were, what are the restraining forces and the driving forces? Because there are certain nuances that you can overlook that other, other programs are struggling with. And um, and and you know so how about you us let's just map it out so this is what um, one program came up with so one of the restraining forces were provider reluctance and discussing anal and oral sex with patients patient reluctance to discussing certain sexual behaviors provider reluctance to obtaining rectal swabs um, patient reluctance to having rectal swabs performed lack of availability of testing time constraints social distance during the pandemic. Look at all these restraining forces. What percentage of them are related to the human side of change? Right? So you can come up with a system, but everything requires, is connected to motivation and beliefs and, and intrinsic. When you think about the, look at the driving forces, um, epidemiology of, uh, uh, the driving forces are, are, you know, data, right? Then the next one is, um, they have a high access acceptability of rectal self swabbing, which is connected, right? Because this rectal self swab helped to overcome some of the reluctance. The more it helps the motivation to shape in the past. Um, the reliability of testing results. Um, more thorough evaluation is a drive driving uh, force. Um, Incident STIs as facilitators of HIV transmission. That's a motivational um, information. Um, three site testing, easy to accomplish when patients come to clinic accordingly in labs. And opt out testing is a, is a norm, it's easy to implement. And that really does jump over a lot of the psychological um, setbacks. You just say, oh, everybody's doing it. <laughs> it's an easy way to, <laughs> to get people to adapt to a change. And that's on a patient level. So. If you look at the restraining forces, just in this one example, you're going to notice that it usually the things that you're addressing usually um, affects um, that area. So I think so. Lastly, um, it takes work. <laughs> so engaging people to do change, um, at the human side, it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. It's not a quick fix. It is an investment that can yield better results for other change. It is a system level fix, um, work culture, building psychological safety. We must be adaptable, but that takes time to build. Each time you engage your team meaningfully in change, it is an investment for future change. And then you'll be able to scale and sustain. So this is a thought to leave with you because I know we're at the end of our time. Now that you know how people change, what are some levers you can use to drive the change? And here are some references and that will be made available. Thank you. Okay, great, wonderful. Thank you so much, Nova. Um, if anyone has any questions or final thoughts for Nova, please you can put it in the chat. And again, as a reminder, um, you know, please do not leave. We're gonna have you uh, do a short poll. But I think you know there are many things to take away from this presentation, and you know, I sort of walk away with a ha ha moment, which is fail forward. Okay. Um, I was just uh, say <laughs> try. It's okay. So I, it, okay, there we go. We're gonna launch the poll. We're gonna launch the poll, guys. Just one second. Okay. So while Shay's doing that, so yeah, so fail forward. That's a big takeaway for me, and it reminds me of a quote that I once heard: that failure is not a learning. It's failure is another learning experience on the road to success. So it's is really another learning experience on the road to success. So with that. I see folks are chiming in on the poll. Thank you very much. Um, 
So again, we thank you for joining us, for participating on this monthly uh, webinar as part of our monthly webinar series. And uh, we look forward to having you join us at the next one. As a reminder, these uh, webinars are held the third or fourth Thursday of each month. So um, you will be getting a, a, an invite to the next one via constant contact. So again, thank you all. Have a great weekend and be safe. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Have a great weekend. Okay. All right, let's end the poll. I think that's everyone. Um...